Okay, so let us continue. So from next week, sessions will be Monday, Wednesday, 1.15 p.m. And we will do it on Zoom. Only two days a week. Only two days a week. Yeah, because now I'm physically here, I wanted to do most part of the class on person, but then the, late, the remaining part will be in Zoom. We can keep going, but given that we have put a lot of hours into this thing, <laughs> almost every session has been at least an hour and a half, and then some of them two hours, we already kind of went really far, so even already. So, but yeah, so let's talk about properties properties of gramo witten classes. So we know that gramo witten invariants are integrals of gramo witten classes against the virtual cycle. We talked a lot about virtual cycle, almost spent two sessions on it. Yes. And now we go back to the classes themselves. So this part is really due to due to Konsevich and uh, Manin, Professor Manin. Okay, so we are going to use this notation that we had before, which is m bar g n x beta, and we know that it goes to uh, m bar g n, and it just goes from here to x to the n, via evaluations by the markings. Okay, so recall that, recall that, that if x is a smooth projective, projective right, then for genus bigger than or equal to zero and n bigger than or equal to zero, and n plus 2g bigger than or equal to 3, the gramma witten class, Witten class maps, maps the following. So this was the gramma witten class ig and beta of alpha, I mean, okay, ig and beta as a map itself is mapping a configurations of n alpha, so that will be in a, sitting in the rational cohomology of x, with n fold rational cohomology of x to rational cohomology of m bar g n. And it's actually given by pull back and then gives in push forward. And it has a involved definition. Also, also for any choice of g and n bigger than or equal to zero, the gramma witten invariant, gramma witten invariant itself is actually defined as a prior, I mean, some kind of a product of i, g, and beta. And uh, it's the thing that takes you a configurations of rational cohomology and fold tensor product basically takes alpha ones, alpha one, alpha two, alpha n tensor with each other from here, pulls them back in here, and integrates it either here or pushes them forward and integrates it either here. So it gives you numbers, right? So it gives you numbers. So that's what the problem is. And then, and then, for the choice of n and 2g which satisfy this inequality, we have in fact that the gramma witten number of alpha 1 alpha n is in fact equal to integral m bar g n of the gramma witten class of alpha 1 to alpha n. The reason we are making a big fuss about this is that we know that this thing is pi, um, 
So we call that pi on pi one, this thing is, can be defined this way. Okay, so a priori, we don't need to have this condition, and gramma with the number can be calculated for any genus on n, but if they satisfy this condition, then the integral of the gramma within class against this virtual cycle is equal to gramma with the Okay. All right, and we also, mentioned what is the meaning of gramma within invariant. The meaning of gramma within invariant is that you have a variety x and you pick in it n cycles. So you pick n cycles z1 and z2 and zn such that the Poincare dual of the homology of these cycles is the choice of your alpha i. And then gramma with a number calculates the choice of genus G curves, the stable maps, with N markings such that the markings exactly match with the locations of these cycles. So the curves that go through these things at given markings, so P1, P2, P3, Pn, like that. And the gramma within class here, this one, what is that? Well, that's the cohomology class of the part of the moduli space of all curves inside this variety, which parameterizes curves with this condition. So how many curves there are is the integral of that class. And what's the cohomology class of that locus of the moduli space? This class, the cohomology class of it. Okay, so that's that. All right, so this is nice. Okay, so now the gramma within classes themselves have properties, and then those properties are nice because it gives us a way of calculating gramma within numbers whenever this condition is satisfied. So axioms satisfied by I, G, and beta. So linearity axiom, linearity axiom, okay? I, G, and beta is linear, is linear in each variable. So, alpha 1 to alpha n, I can say alpha 1 to alpha n. In each variable, the variables are cohomology classes, alpha i's. Since um, sum of cycles is their union. Okay. So it's linear. Okay. Mm, no problem. Mm. What else? Yeah? Effectivity axiom. Effectivity axiom. For X projective, projective IGN beta is zero if beta is not 
an effective curve class. Curve class. So what does this mean? F lower star of the class of C is effective effect e effective whenever f from c to x is a mm, holomorphic map holomorphic map okay so you know that in cohomology theory, you can pick cycles, and not every cycle is a holomorphic, holomorphic subspace. It's not. If you pick a cycle whose homology is in degree two, meaning it's a two-dimensional cycle which doesn't come from a holomorphic map, then the class, the class for that cycle, choice of a cycle is going to be zero. Why? Because the class represents the holomorphic curves in the space X that pass through certain alpha i's. Of course, I mean, we are counting maps from holomorphic curves, Max, maps from curves to ambient variety such that their class is represented by class of a holomorphic curve. If your variety, ambient variety, is a symplectic manifold, meaning it has a symplectic form, then there is another way of seeing what holomorphic or effective means. Um, in, in case, in case um, of a symplectic manifold, right, M omega, um, omega or x omega. X omega. So you have the symplectic um, non-degenerate closed two form on your variety x. This effectivity axiom. Effectivity axiom um, is equivalent. Is equivalent to a. Uh, I G and beta being equal to zero whenever integral of the canonical of the symplectic form of X against beta is less than zero. Symplectic form is a two form. So when you look at the harm cohomology of your variety, you can easily see that this is in H upper two, as a curve class sits in upper uh, lower two. So you're associated, you're supposed to get the number. And if the curve class is non effective, this would be a less than zero. And um, that's not what you'd like to have. Okay. Okay. So that's in the case of a symplectic manner. Right. So this is effectivity axiom, degree axiom, degree axiom for alpha one to alpha n in h upper star of x with rational coefficients and full tensor product of it um, we have that i g n beta alpha one to alpha n is h upper star of m bar g n q yes remember this sits in not m bar g n x beta but it's in m bar g n Yes, and um, has 
the following degree. So its degree is going to be 2 times g minus 1. This is the real degree. 2 times g minus 1 times dimension of x, complex dimension of x, plus 2 times omega x against beta, plus sum of the degrees of alpha i's from 1 to n. We calculated this thing. We calculated the degree of i, g, and beta, if you remember. Mm -hmm. This follows, this follows from definition, the fact that i, g, and beta of alpha 1 to alpha n is equal to pi 2 lower shrink of pi 1 upper star of alpha 1 times alpha n, like that. So we actually obviously see that the sum of the degrees of alpha i's is in here. We pushed it back over there. And then on, on there, we kind of poncaradolized it. And then we took that thing and pushed it forward onto m bar g n. And then up there, we kind of, we did this for a situation where m bar g and x beta has overflow the structure, so Poincaré duality exists. Okay, so that's that. So that's the degree of the linearity axiom, effectivity axiom, degree axiom, so far. Okay, the degree axiom, the degree axiom implies um, that I, G, N, beta of alpha 1 to alpha N mm -hmm. is of top degree If and only if sum from 1 to n of degree of alpha i is 2 times 1 minus g times dimension over complex numbers of x minus 2 times omega of x plus 2 times 3g minus 3 plus n. Otherwise, I, G, and beta will be equal to zero. Okay, when would it be of top degree? This is when it has to do with um, this axiom about some degrees of alpha. Okay. So that's the degree axiom. Degree axiom actually tells us kind of restrictions that we have on here, right? I mean, it, the degree axiom and the restriction on the degree of alpha i's is really because of the fact that, well, you can pick whatever you want for the degree of alpha i's. But then you pull it back and you push it forward on m bar g n. So you lose a little bit of your flexibility there. <laughs> so as you're looking at the expected dimension of m bar g n, uh, then you can see that you need to have a well-defined class there. Okay. Okay, so that's that. And then you have equivariant, equivariance axiom. Axiom. Equivariance with respect to what? The map, the map I, G, and beta from X, Q to H upper star of M bar G, N, Q, this map, yeah, is S, N equivariant mm 
right? It's SN equivariant, and you remember this thing. When you're looking at, when you, if you remember we were doing M0N, remember we were doing M0N, we actually discussed about automorphisms of these things. And one part of the automorphism was, of course, moving the components of the re irreducible components of the curve around, and the other part was moving the points around, the labeling of a point. So you have n points, and the a permutation group Sn mutates the points around. And we looked at these configurations. For instance, over M04, we had a P1, and on each divisor of the P1, we had curve configurations like trees, and um, we were moving labels around. Sn is acting on, 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 on the moduli space because it permutes the points, the markings. So as an equivariant where Sn, the permutation group of order n, acts on um, h upper star of x with q n-fold tensor product. It mutates alpha 1 to alpha n. And Sn acts on this one also Q by permuting permuting PIs in F from C P1 to Pn to X. Ah, no, not X. No X. It's the moduli space of n pointed curves. That's it. So you have action of Sn here, and you have action of Sn here, and this morphism is Sn equivariant. Hmm? If you move the parameters here around, it needs to be compatible with moving the mark points around. And it makes sense. It does, because if you move the alpha i's around, and you're assuming that P1 to Pn are going to land on alpha 1s, that means you're moving the P1 to Pn around. Hmm. Okay. For gramma Witten invariance, invariance, this equivariance, equivariance means, um, means that if I calculate IGN beta of alpha 1 to alpha i and alpha i plus 1, and then alpha n, that's going to be minus 1 to the degree of alpha i times the degree of alpha i plus 1 times the gramma the invariant of IGN beta alpha 1 to alpha i plus 1, alpha i, and then alpha. So if you swap the position of their parameters for the gramma within class, then the new gramma within class will be multiplied by minus 1 to the degree of alpha i times the degree of alpha I plus one. So it's very similar to parameters in here being super parameters or super variables. So you're expecting that gramma within class defines for you an additional structure on the cohomology theory of your variety. And that additional structure is some kind of a superstructure. Hmm. So you're expecting that if you look at the cohomology theory of your variety, just pick random cycles, you can multiply them. You can think of cycles as variables, multiply them. Alpha i and alpha i plus 1. Multiplication of cycles, it is intersection of the cycles. 
That's what cohomology theory does. There is an intersection form, and intersection of the cycles is multiplication of the cycles, cap product. But then via gramma wooden theory, it seems like you also have a new notion of multiplication of them, which is also some kind of intersection, right? And what is that? It's a weak kind of intersection. So if I have two cycles, alpha i and alpha i plus 1, honest intersection of them could be either 0 or none, or it would be the cohomology class of some co-dimension cycle, whatever, depending on the dimension of these things. And this would be the alpha i, and this is the representation of alpha i plus alpha times alpha i plus 1, and it's the class of, well, if this is the Poincaré dual of zi, and if this is the Poincaré dual of zi plus 1, this is the class of zi intersection zi plus 1 dual. So that's the intersection of those things. And then, good, but then now we have some kind of another notion of intersection. And this notion of intersection is a weak notion of intersection. So it's kind of also, you see, this notion of intersection produces a number. Do you agree? If I take these and integrate them over some appropriate homology class, I get a number. So it might be that if these are co-dimension 1 intersecting them, would give me number of intersection of these, right? And that's great. It gives a number. So this also gives me some kind of intersection number. So, but that number is the gramma witten number. So in some sense, alpha i and alpha i plus 1 are weakly intersecting. And why is the weakly intersection? Because in instead of intersection, I can say they are weakly intersecting. If there is a curve of genus G with N marking that passes through alpha I and passes through alpha I plus 1. And this intersection number depends on topological parameters of the curve that passes through them. So out of this and counting how many curves I can pass through this one and this one, I can also compute a number. And that number is the weak intersection of alpha i and alpha i plus 1. So as you can see, in cohomology theory of your variety, you have the honest uh, intersection theory, for which alpha and alpha i plus 1 are commutative variables. And via weak intersection theory, you have alpha i and alpha i plus 1 being supercommutative variables. So if you just think about the space that parameterizes alpha i's, and that's the cohomology theory of your variety with rational coefficients, you have two notions of inner product, two metrics. One of them gives these numbers, and one of them gives these numbers. Let's call them g and g prime. And then you can actually see that the second metric kind of gives Cohomology theory of your variety, the structure of a Frobenius manifold, some kind of an ex ex extra superstructure. So, on any variety, you will have two notions of intersection theory on it. Mm. And honest intersection and weak intersection, right? So, modern mathematics. Classical mathematics. So in the classical times, we would either meet if we meet in person or not. But nowadays, we talk with the phone. So we weekly meet. Same exact thing. It's like there is a phone wiring between alpha i and alpha i plus 1. So very similar. OK. Oh, I must say, it's not that modern, but, but anyway, there's way more modern stuff these days. But anyway, fundamental, we will talk about this. By the way, 
the structure that this induces on cohomology theory of your variety and the notion of intersection theory that it induces on the cohomology theory of your variety, this map, which depends on topological parameters of your curves, the fact that these topological parameters are G and N, and these are pretty much quantum parameters, right? Because there's a chamber for genus G and N mark points, and there's another change a chamber if you change G or you change N, right? So this cohomology theory is called quantum cohomology. Okay, so what is quantum cohomology? It is some kind of extension of cohomology theory in which we kind of define a weak intersection between elements of cohomology. Okay, fundamental class axiom. Mm. If n plus 2g is bigger than 4, then there exists a natural map. There exists a natural map pi of n from m bar g n to m bar g n minus 1. And this is forgetting the last marked point. So rediscuss this thing. If you're just if you're forgetting markings only on the space of curves, in the interior you just forget the marking, there's no problem. On the boundary of this thing, it might be that you have a stable curve and forgetting the mark point you know, makes some of the components of it unstable, in which case when you land in here, those unstable components collapse. We had a similar thing, and I'm reviewing it because I don't, I want you to kind of separate things and put them in appropriate shelves in your brain. So we had the several other thing, which was here we had M bar G and X beta, and it was mapping to M bar G N, and that was forgetting the map. And again, we had some kind of destabilization process, in which case, because the condition for the maps, the stability of the maps is different than the stability of the curve, forgetting the map could give you components which are unstable as curves, so those need to collapse as well. Okay, but this is not that, this is just forgetting a marked point. So, okay, if X sits inside H, if you are looking at fundamental cycle of X, fundamental cycle is the, the whole thing, it's called dimension zero, is the fundamental cycle, is fundamental cycle, then I, G, N, beta of alpha one to alpha N minus one, and degree of x, fundamental cycle of x, okay, that would be back pi n of i g n minus 1 beta of alpha 1 to alpha n minus 1. As you can see, if I put all of x in here, this has degree 0 in cohomology. And so already, it's, it's, you know, this, this doesn't count. So that, that, think about degree axiom. So one of the alpha i's has degree zero. So you can just, here there is no that alpha. So it's like you put, it's like you're calculating this one. Right, so you're getting rid of one of the alphas. There, so there must be some com communication between these two things because the degrees definitely do match. Here you don't have alpha, but here you don't have alpha in either because that's degree zero. I mean, you have an alpha n, but its degree is zero, which is a fundamental cycle of x. Okay, so that's that. Hmm. 
Okay, so that is that. Then the fundamental cycle, the fundamental cycle axiom implies implies the i, g, and beta of alpha 1 to alpha n minus 1 and the fundamental cycle of x is going to be non-zero when only when i, g, n i, g, n beta alpha 1 alpha n minus 1 is of top degree is a top degree class Okay. All right. Hmm. Here is the divisor axiom. Fundamental class axiom means you pick for one of alphas the fundamental cycle of x. Now you pick a divisor class. If n plus 2g is bigger than or equal to 4, then there is a map high n from m bar g n to m bar g n minus 1. If alpha n sits inside h2 of x with rational coefficients, meaning it's co-dimension 1, because in, this is in the real degree, then mm, pi n lower star of i, g, n beta, alpha 1 to alpha n, alpha n minus 1, and n is going to be integral of alpha n against beta, i, g, and beta, alpha 1, alpha n minus 1. So it would be this number times this class. Hmm. And uh, you kind of can see it, right? Because what does this mean? It means the curves of genus G with n markings with homology class beta that pass through this many cycles. Now, the last cycle is a hypersurface, codimension 1. Okay, so this curve definitely passes this one at some number of points, right? So it should be the same. That moduli space should be how many possible intersections those curves would have with alpha n. So that's how many possible intersections they have times the rest of the moduli space, which needs to parameterize curves passing through the rest of the cycle. Right? So that wouldn't be so bad, right? So these curves going through the hypersurface can all be parameterized in terms of their degree against that hypersurface, meaning the point of intersection of the curve. So that parameterizes them. Curves that meet alpha n with one point and two points. And for each locus, curves meet alpha n with one point. There is a, a whole rest of the moduli space that needs to parameterize the rest of the cycles. Curves that meet this twice, three times. Okay, so these numbers are all going to be there. So that's intuition behind it, but Proof is, if given f in from c to p1 to pn to x um, stable such that um, f of pi is in zi and lower star of the class of the curve is equal to beta for i from 1 to n minus 1, then f of pn 
is going to be in f of c intersected with zn and that's beta intersected with zn which means that which means this is exactly what i say which means that there are there exists there exists integral of alpha n against beta many choices many choices for f of pn so because you would like pn to to land on the last one and this zn is the one that this zn is a uh, Poincaré dual of zn is alpha n okay so this zn is the hopper surface right so the last point how many choices does it have this many choices yeah which is basically what we just said so divisor axiom so each time that you pick one of these to be a divisor you can relate ign beta to the previous IGN beta. That way. Okay. And that's the divisor axiom. Oh, all right. Oops, what happened? Oh. Hmm. Point mapping axiom. Case where, hmm, case where beta is equal to zero. Point mapping. If the image of the curve is a zero class, it means that the map is constant, right? It's a constant map because it collapses the whole curve and sends it to a point. There is no curve left in the image. So it's a point and it's a constant map. And we know the stability of constant maps. If the map applies to reducible curve, and there are components of the curve that are being sent to a point, it better be that the domain of the map is stable. So if this is genus zero, it needs to have three points. If this genus one, one point, if genus two and higher is okay. If the map is non-constant, we don't need to worry about that. So this is, this is that. So when genus of the domain curve is zero, if alpha i are homogeneous cohomology uh, classes, then um, i zero n zero of alpha one to alpha n is going to be oh, well, it's not good. So it's going to be integral over x of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n against um, fundamental cycle of m bar g n if sum of the degrees of alpha i is equal to 2 times dimension of x or zero otherwise hmm. all right point mapping axiom okay so curve class is zero and then you can actually calculate X, uh, the degree of the gramma within class and this integral against beta canonical bundle against the uh, symplectic form against the but beta is going away so it induces this restriction on your 
degree of alpha i. And here is the proof. Okay, a map, map F from C to P1, Pn to X such that F lower star of C is equal to zero must be constant. Must be constant. Therefore, thus, it's a constant map, then f of c, if it is, I mean, it's a constant map. I mean, you remember, right? It's a constant map, but then it's also trying to make the curve pass through n cycles. So it kills the whole curve, but it, ma it also wants the curve to pass through n cycles. So where should the curve go to? It should go to intersection of all those cycles, right? N, n of them, so it, that's the only possibility, right? <laughs> okay, so it's a constant, and then uh, thus f of c must be equal to, uh, or belong to, Z1, Z2, Zn, because it's a point of map where sum to the n of degree of alpha i is going to be two times dimension of x. So this, the class then, class, grammar Witten class has degree zero by degree by degree axiom okay so that's what it is so this is this is why this result. So if I look at a, okay, no. So corollary of this thing is that the grammar with the number I zero N zero of alpha one to alpha N, the number is going to be integral of alpha one in alpha two, alpha three over X if N is equal to three and otherwise zero. Okay, this is the only way that the grammar within class can have degree zero. You can look at the expected dimension and the degree of the grammar within class, otherwise it will be zero. Only true for genus zero, so only, only holds true for genus zero. This thing, this thing. So it's a pointed map from n marked points into, I mean, it, it, into ambient variety. Genus zero. Otherwise, as soon as g is different, then the degree of the grammar within class uh, uh, kind of. Uh, kind of induces extra conditions on alpha i. Okay, so a splitting axiom. Assume G 
is G1 plus G2. And N is N1 plus N2. So I'm splitting the genus and I'm splitting number of my points. Such that this condition is satisfied. Ni plus 2 times Gi is bigger than or equal to 2 for I plus 1 and 2. So for each splitting, you have that. Given a stable maps, given stable maps, CP1 to P, hmm, now C1, P1 to P of N1. Why am I writing this this way? N1 and N2. Yeah, and C2, Q1 to Q of N2, right? Of, oh, now I understand what's the point. <laughs> okay, N1 plus 1 and N2 plus 1. I understand what's the problem. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. Because the, given this, uh, of respective respective genus G1 and G2, then C obtained from C1 union C2 by identifying identifying P of N1 plus 1 and Q of N2 plus 1 induces a stable curve, a stable curve, which is C1 union C2 with the choice of P1 to uh, P of N1 and then Q1 to Q of N2. Of genus G. Of genus G equal to G1 plus G2. All right, so that's that. This is because of the stability, because when you separate them, you need more mark points, so and you collapse, one of them goes away. So hence we obtain a map, hence we obtain a map from phi, m bar, mm -hmm. G1, G1, and uh, N1 plus 1 times M bar of G2 and N2 plus 1, 2, M bar of G and N. When N is N1 plus N2, based on that. So here is the splitting axiom. So splitting axiom actually tells you, if I start from grammar written class in here, pull it back in here, how does it split? So it says that phi upper star of i, g, and beta of alpha 1 to alpha n is going to be equal to, going to be equal to Summing over all possible splittings of the curve classes and summing over i and j, g i j, i of g1 and 1 plus 1, beta, alpha 1, um, 
alpha n and t i tensor with i of g2 n2 plus 1 beta 2 all um, tj alpha mm, n n1 alpha n1 plus 1 2 alpha n And you see, this is this extra class that actually tells you that you're adding a mark point, right? But if you're adding a mark point to here and to here, that basically means you have choices of choosing cycles that the curve with one extra point needs to pass through and the choice of a cycle that one with more extra needs to pass through. So, okay, so you have choice, and then what are these Ti and Tj? I will tell you. Hmm. So, where Ti is a homogeneous homogeneous basis of homology theory of X with rational coefficients. Hmm. And uh, GIJ equal to GIJ inverse is the intersection metric. It's defined as follows. So it's uh, Gij is given by Ti intersected with Ga integrated over x. Yeah. So this is a metric. This is the base of cohomology of x, and this matrix has a uh, this metric has a matrix representation, and entries of this matrix are these numbers. And this uh, metric is invertible, and the inverse of this metric is the one that you put over there. Okay, so uh, the mark. Remind yourself that cohomology cohomology class of diagonal in H star of X Q is summing of the GIJ. Ti tensor Tj. Right. If you want to look at cohomology class of the diagonal inside h star xq times h star xq. This is the, this is exactly what the diagonal is. Basis of the diagonal is given by tensor product of the basis of h star xq. And the coefficients are given by intersection of these things. That's what it is. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It means 
if I'm looking at h star xq times h star xq, and I'm looking at diagonal embedding of it inside here, then cohomology class of diagonal is given by that. Okay, uh, here is the proof of the splitting axiom. So, you have m bar gn, you are splitting a curve, you have g1, g2, c1, c2, n1 plus 1 points in here, n2 plus 1 points in there. And the last additional point that you add, give, for C1, the C1 needs to pass through some cycle, and that's the TI. The C2 needs to pass through the cycle, and that's the TJ. And the sum is given over this thing. So we want to prove that, right? The proof is the following. Phi upper star of a map from C1 union C2 with N markings into the ambient X oops, is given by choice of maps from C1 union C2 and P1 to P of N1 P P N1 plus 1 to Pn, so there is n2 many on here, there is n1 many in here, and q, yes, to x, where, uh, uh, x, where, f lower star of c1, plus f lower star of c2, is equal to beta, and f of pi is inside ci. And f of p is equal to f of q. f of p and q needs to meet. So this automatically, I mean, you guys are advanced, right? Automatically tells you why we are looking at the diagonal, because with Location of P and Q, I'm picking cohomology classes and bases in here and itself. But I don't want to just randomly choose any tuples. I want them to be compatible. So I'm looking at diagonal because I want to have the choice of F of P equal to F of Q because this is a splitting of a curve. Okay, so that's the reason. We want F of P f of q to be 